Hello there, I'm Kaz. You know, there's an often unspoken rule among Final Fantasy fans and the gaming community itself that the Final Fantasy series died after Final Fantasy X. Something which, frankly, I don't agree with entirely. The beloved JRPG series that started out on the Famicom, Hironobu Sakaguchi's Final Fantasy quickly became one of the most well-known and acclaimed RPG series of all time, with one of the most vocal, shall we put it, fan bases in all of gaming. In recent years, the series has seen some drastic changes that have split the fanbase into too many pieces to count, with many clamoring for the series to return to its roots, or others hoping that Final Fantasy XV will get things right this time. While it's true that there never was, is, or will be consensus in any video game series, let alone Final Fantasy, there's usually a majority or minority of people that share the same opinion. Final Fantasy is not that kind of series. Not even for the games that people consider to be classics. Final Fantasy X is one of the worst, most annoying goddamn games I ever played in my life. It's a series where the only thing that is generally agreed upon is that 7 is the most popular entry. I will concede to the fact that the changes made after 10 were far more drastic than the titles before it, and that the active time battle system was a staple from 4 to 9, but Final Fantasy has always been a series that changed from iteration to iteration. Some entries may have changed more than others, but each new Final Fantasy was an exploration of new worlds and characters with new ideas and themes to accompany them. And with the 15th installment looking to take a few pages out of Kingdom Hearts book, I think we can all agree that the classic job-changing monster sling days of old are a thing of the past for Final Fantasy. That is, in the main entries. In 2010, Square's venerable RPG giant spun off with a new art style and old-school gameplay in Final Fantasy IV Heroes of Light. It was meant to be a return to Squaresoft's, now dubbed Square Enix, classic JRPG roots. And it was an utter mess. Four Heroes of Light is not a bad game, but it's a far cry from the classics it clearly took inspiration from. Its visuals are beautiful on the DS's screen, but the music was lacking, the writing was below par, and the gameplay less than enjoyable. Oh, and mages completely broke the game. Well, at least as far as I got. Admittedly, I did never get around to finishing it, but that was mainly due to the poor pacing and relatively generic characters making me lose interest in reaching the end somewhere around the 50 hour mark. It had some great ideas, like the combat system, but overall perfectly captured the frustration of an old school RPG without a hint of the fun gameplay or great writing that accompanies those dreary hours of grinding. Thankfully, we have its spiritual successor to look forward to hammering out those rough points with Bravely Default for the 3DS. With the sequel already spreading its wings in Japan, has Square's brave new title soared higher than ever before? Or have they plummeted down to an all new low? Strap in and let's find out. A fine sea breeze. Foretelling its death is a hoax in poor taste. The plot is set into several chapters, starting off with a giant chasm opening up and swallowing the village of our main character, Tiz. It's said that the chasm will destroy the world if it goes unchecked, so naturally, four completely unrelated youths must come together to awaken the powers of the four crystals and save the world. Along the way, I'll come across friend and foe alike, make new allies, and learn about an anti-crystal movement called the Crystal Orthodoxy. Without delving too deep into the plot, it's your typical Final Fantasy fare, but it's well done, with the translation having a hint of ye old English sprinkled about, adding to the old school Final Fantasy slash Dragon Quest charm. The characters you meet are likable, and the lore of the world is incredibly rich. The pacing is great as well. It knows just when to stop the main plot and let the characters breathe and develop. The only problem with the story is that this crystal orthodoxy is painted so black and white by the heroes, it makes you wonder why it was included for anything but a need for conflict. As a result, the villain's goal feels somewhat contrived and they suffer for it. There's no one here as memorable as Kefka, tragic as Golbez, or whatever your favorite Final Fantasy villain may be. They're just kind of there because, well, we can't have an RPG without a villain, of course. Also, while the writing is generally good, the voice acting is, um... I'll show you! I'll show you all! <laughs> Fire! 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 Yeah, we'll get to that. Come chapter 5, the third act slowly deteriorates in quality, but the first two are fine enough to forgive the weak falling action. To sum it up, Bravely Default's tale may not be one for the ages, but it's classic. As classic as the games it took inspiration from.
gameplay-wise, Bravely Default is an exercise in balance. It attempts to create an RPG that's easy for newcomers, while providing a challenge to those hardened veterans who've been familiar with the genre for years. Boiled down to its core, it's classic 2D Final Fantasy with a 3D coat of paint and modern traits of gaming like endless tutorials. The tutorials here are incredibly obnoxious and can get really annoying really fast. Even if you don't want to see them, you'll have to go through them every single time one pops up, because there is no option to turn them off. Even when you're 20 hours in, they won't stop popping up to explain everything, and it comes off as incredibly inorganic to a game that tries to show you the organic mechanics commonly found in the genre. That said, one thing that I do appreciate is that the map shows the location of your goal. It lets you know where to go, but not how to get there, making the destination clear, but the journey vague. Rather clever, really. There's a large open world to explore, dungeons to conquer, jobs to earn, and side quests to fill in time between the massive playtime Brave the Default commands. Certain events will happen at either daytime or night, like a certain character to talk to or different enemies appearing. It helps give the world a more lively feeling to it, something that the surprisingly low random encounter rate fails to do. Yes, you can turn up the random encounter rate to an incredibly high level, but on the, ahem, default setting, there's not that many battles to begin in dungeons or the overworld. That said, the battles you do have are immensely enjoyable, thanks to the battle system and its main hook. On the surface, combat may seem like your typical RPG fare, attack, defend, abilities, and so on, but what sets it apart is the Brave and Default system. During battle, you can attack like you normally do in a JRPG, you choose from one option, your opponent chooses another, rinse and repeat until one of you is defeated, however, you can also choose to either Brave or Default. Choosing Brave will consume a turn point, but allows you to select an additional move on the same turn, and you can choose to Brave up to three times. You can choose to Brave so long as you have at least zero points, but it means that you won't be able to move for a couple of turns. The default command, on the other hand, functions as defend, but with a twist. Not only does it reduce damage taken, but it gives you an extra turn point to use when you choose Brave. The system is incredibly satisfying, fun to use, but easy to abuse in normal encounters. Almost encouragingly so, as one turn victories means more XP, and not getting hit means more job points, so during these encounters you'll be using Brave far more than you do default. However, you have to be careful because your enemies can do the same thing to you. The bosses are especially tricky when it comes to this. It's in these teeth grindingly tough battles where Brave the Default battle system truly shines, timing your defenses with their patterns, and striking back as hard as you can with your most powerful techniques. There's a diverse amount of abilities to use in battle, thanks in large part to the excellent job system in Brave the Default. Anyone who's played Final Fantasy 3, the Japanese 3, not the American 3, 5, or Tactics will feel right at home. You can choose from a pool of 24 different job classes and up to 5 different skills from any class. In addition, you can mix and match abilities to create a mixed class, like a white mage using black magic, a knight using white magic, a ninja wielding axes, and so on. In general, the customization available is incredible. The multiple classes, the many jobs and abilities. You can even change the speed of battle in the midst of an attack. In between battles, there's a minigame where you choose a certain number of villagers you retain from Street Pass and send them off to do tasks. Each task requires a certain amount of time to complete, and more villagers will cut down on time it takes to complete one. When complete, they provide you bonuses like items, new abilities, and equipment. It's a neat little game to break up sessions between dungeons, but be warned. If you live in an area where street passing with strangers is rare, your experience with this will be miserable. The dungeons are well designed and unique, even if some have hazards that make the journey more difficult than it should be. Honestly, Bravely Default can be considered even more difficult than its family series. The older Final Fantasy games would have healing springs, tents, or some other way to heal your party members besides potions and magic. Here, using magic quickly drains your MP, and the only way to restore them in dungeons costs a lot of coin and are incredibly scarce to find early on. Your MP doesn't even get restored when you level up, and places to heal in dungeons are a rarely found blessing. Later on, it makes sense. You've leveled up a lot and have the money to buy all the ethers and healing items you need, but early on, things can get pretty tough. That's not so much a point of critique, just an observation of the overall difficulty. From beginning to end, Breathly Default is a challenging test of skill, but not one that's unfairly so. My only complaints are nitpicks, but there's quite a few of those here. You can't turn the camera around in dungeons, menus where characters are separated from options and other tasks, you walk super slow in the overworld, and for some reason, there are quick time events to awaken the crystals. These are all, at worst, inconvenient. They're nothing game breaking, they're just a touch irritating. Although, if I may harp on the last one for a moment, it's to my understanding that these quick time events are supposed to be, you know, quick. But when they take over a minute to complete, they quit being quick time events and end up just being, well, time events. Again, it's a nitpick. One that doesn't detract from how much fun there is to be had exploring the wonderful world of Bravely Default. Finally, the presentation. 
Breathe the Default's art style is similar to Four Heroes of Light, and it looks gorgeous on the 3DS. The backgrounds in particular really stand out, giving the game a storybook-like feeling, and the details on every piece of equipment are an especially nice touch. On the sound side of things, Breathe the Default has some decent sound effects, but boasts an excellent score, courtesy of the band that brought you that Attack on Titan scene that everybody seems to like for some reason. There's a good mix of softer songs for exploring the world, and harsh rating tunes for the toughest in those boss battles, and they all sound wonderful. My only problem is that some of the songs sound out of place for a fantasy world. They're not bad whatsoever, in fact, they're some of the more memorable tracks, it's just that they don't fit in with the setting portrayed in the game. Fitting or not, the soundtrack is one of the high points of Breathe the Default. The same can't be said for the voice acting. Done! Done! <laughs> We've supplies to last a fortnight! Cannonballs to rain iron on Caldisla for a week straight! Yeah, it's bad. But that's all that can be said about its badness. It's not cheesy like some old school RPGs. Oh! It's not meme-worthy like Zero Wing, it's just poor voice acting that does no justice to the writing and can thankfully be turned off. Still, VA aside, Silicon Studio and Square Enix did an excellent job crafting an RPG that's not only fun to play, but a joy to look at and pleasure to listen to. I know those of you in Europe already know this, but it bears repeating. Bravely Default is one heck of an RPG. Though it doesn't turn the title to what it's obviously inspired by, Bravely Default is a love letter to fans of classic Japanese role-playing games with some fresh ideas that really work. Its first half is better than its second, but it's an all-around solid effort from Square, Silicon Studio, and Nintendo. Kudos to all three companies for bringing this wonderful little RPG to the West. If you own a 3DS and you love RPGs, then check out Bravely Default. It's one of the system's finest, earning an 8 out of 10. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to roleplay as a Canadian. Until next time, game on, my friends. Ah, it's made in the US. I don't know what that there is a boot. Seriously, people, we don't talk like that.